The following CBS 19 weather special is sponsored by Stonewater Roofing and Gas and Supply. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Extreme East Texas, when sunny turns severe. I'm Chief Meteorologist Brett Anthony. I'm Meteorologist Chandler Jordan. Over the next half hour, we're going to take you to a hypervelocity impact laboratory and just show you how impactful tornado debris can be. And I'm Colleen Campbell. We'll also go over those warning sirens that are placed all throughout East Texas and a school in East Texas that's doing its best to protect its students. But first, five years ago this month, we had the deadly EF4 tornadoes in Van Zandt County. Tonight, we introduce you to a survivor who remembers that day vividly. You can see 198. We were never able to see 198 before. There goes another car right up there. Never able to see that house up through there before. There is a before and after now in Cheryl Hughes's life. It's April 29th, 2017 the day an EF4 tornado destroyed her home in rural Van Zandt County. And it was just kind of a normal day. It rained kind of off and on, but nothing that really caused any alarm for me. Hughes had just returned home from first Monday trade days in Canton. The monthly flea market held the weekend before the first Monday of each month. I had been home about 30 minutes or so when it hit. This is video of one of the seven tornadoes that struck that day. Cheryl's husband, Kenny, went to the backyard where he saw the largest tornado, an EF4 with winds estimated at 180 miles an hour. It was coming right for their house. They headed to the bathroom for shelter. You know, it's funny, people say it'll sound like a train or whatever. I never heard anything like that. Um, I remember as I walked through the bathroom door, feeling pressure in my ears. And I, at that moment, I thought, oh, there's something out there close but I didn't realize it was that close. The tornado tore the roof off the house, knocked Cheryl unconscious, and threw her about 900 feet. She woke up in her neighbor's yard. I really feel like the tornado put me up there because I had two broken ankles. I don't think I could have walked from here to there. And my husband was found about 100 feet the other way. Cheryl and Kenny were high school sweethearts and were married for 40 years. Kenny was one of four people killed that day by tornadoes that swept across Henderson, Hopkins, Rains, and Van Zandt counties. I do believe that um, God tells us that our days are numbered, and I do believe that that was his day. You know, he could have had a heart attack if we were sitting in a storm shelter. Cheryl suffered multiple broken bones, a spinal injury, cuts, and bruises. The roads were blocked by trees preventing ambulance and paramedics from reaching her. This picture shows Cheryl trapped to a door that was taken off its hinges and used as a stretcher so she could be taken to the hospital. They drove me to Canton. They had triage set up at the high school. And as soon as I got there, they just said, mm, put her in that ambulance and take her to Tyler. I'd never been in a tornado like that before, but it was really amazing at the number of people who called and wanted to help. Canton Mayor Lou Ann Everett met us at a car dealership on Interstate 20 just outside Canton in Van Zandt County. The dealership was devastated just days before opening. And they, were, they were ready to move in and that thing hit and cars were just thrown everywhere and it was tremendous. The city of Canton avoided a direct hit. Amazing perhaps considering there were four tornadoes that came within a mile of Canton, including three long track tornadoes. The strongest was the Eustis to West Canton tornado. It's rated as an EF4 with 180 mile an hour winds. The longest tracked tornado of the day formed east of Canton and traveled 40 miles to Emory. Another tornado lifted just south of Canton. The city was missed, but became the center of recovery. It served as a staging area, dumping grounds, and offered rooms to support the flood of volunteers who came to help recovery efforts. 
and people were so generous and so gracious and it was truly amazing the number of people that came in with barbecue. We had enough barbecue to feed an army, which thankfully we needed. We had an army here working. Six tornadoes hit Van Zant County, the most on an April 29th since 1950. Yeah, the EF4 that, that hit the Cheryl Hughes's home was also the strongest in the county since 1950. Hughes rebuilt her home on the same spot she lived before, just across the pasture from her daughter's home. But they also added something else. This is her little shelter. With my daughter, she was like, well, Mom, did we get a storm shelter? She said, I, I believe it was Papa's time to go. And I said, and I do too. I said, I think a storm shelter will give your kids a lot of peace of mind. It'll give us peace of mind, you know. And it's not a bad thing to have something to try to help keep you safe. This is a sturdy shelter. All of the walls and the ceiling, they're at least a foot thick and it goes 10 feet deep. We usually bring like iPads and things like that. Kids can put in earplugs, things like that to keep them from being afraid. The shelter is a part of life after the tornado, but Cheryl is back to doing some things she did before the tornado. For instance, raising cows and chickens, including this red hen who survived the tornado. Yeah, y'all know where we go, come on. But it doesn't take long before a reminder of April 29th, 2017 appears. It's funny, every time it rains, you see little, like there are little pieces of stuff <laughs> that are out here still after five years, little pieces of plastic and glass. And just one example of how East Texas weather can be extreme and go from sunny to severe just like that. I'm CBS 19 Chief Meteorologist Brett Anthony. As our spring severe weather season continues, it's important to remember some of the terminology that you may hear us use. One of the most important things is the difference between a watch and a warning. When a watch is issued, this means that all the ingredients exist for the development of severe weather. While storms may be on the way, this does not mean there are any active weather alerts. Active weather alerts occur when a warning is issued. This means that the atmosphere has organized and a life-threatening storm is in your area. When a warning is issued, especially if it's a tornado warning, your smartphone will frequently vibrate, produce a loud tone, and send you a text message. This means a wireless emergency alert has been sent by an authorized government agency. When the National Weather Service issues one of these during severe weather season, it can be for a severe thunderstorm, flash flood, or even a tornado warning. To sum it up, a watch is issued by having the right factors in the atmosphere for severe weather, like bringing together ingredients to bake a cake. A warning is issued when those factors create dangerous storms, just like mixing the cake ingredients together and putting it in the oven. It's best to have multiple ways to receive alerts for watches and warnings. Meteorologist Colleen Campbell is going to talk about your options and what to do when you hear a warning siren a little later.
right here on Highway 155 and headed down to Texas A&M's Relis campus towards the Center for Infrastructure Renewal. Once I get down there, we're going to talk with Dr. Lacey and his team of engineers, and we're going to show you what types of impacts can be felt from tornadic debris. Tornadoes are some of the most breathtaking yet destructive phenomena that occur on planet Earth. On average, it's estimated that each tornado causes $2.5 million in damage, which can be more depending on location and strength. Dr. Lacey and his team of engineers at the Hypervelocity Impact Laboratory typically conduct high-speed experiments. For our purposes, they were able to slow down their equipment to mimic velocities found within a tornado. In our laboratory, we've established the capability to launch projectiles at hypervelocities. Typically, that means speeds in the range of 2 kilometers a second to 8 kilometers a second, or on the high end, 18,000 miles per hour. Uh, as part of this story, we've modified our experimental setup to allow us to, to shoot uh, airborne projectiles at velocities consistent with peak wind speeds in tornadoes, typically 2 to 300 miles per hour. When we launched projectiles at different materials, one common theme emerged. The more layers of protection that you have, the more likely you are to be unharmed by debris. You want to put as many walls between you and the exterior as possible because our experiments show that uh, representative wall structures in, in conventional homes offer very little penetration resistance when it comes to projectiles traveling at two to 300 miles per hour. If you have a given wall and it slows the projectile down from 300 miles per hour to 100 miles per hour, and then you have another wall that slows the, the residual, the initial residual velocity of the projectile from 100 miles per hour to 50 miles per hour, the goal is to, to, to gradually slow the projectile or penetrator down as much as possible before it reaches uh, the human or the asset you're looking at. These experiments even have a personal connection to the team. Sarah Beth Reagan, a sophomore engineering major at Texas A&M, had her home damaged by a tornado a couple of years ago. Yeah, so I was woken up by the storm because there was like really big thunder and it woke me up and then um, my parents came and were like, hey, there's a tornado warning. Um, and so we went and got in a room in the center of our house that doesn't have windows. Although a portion of her home was damaged, thankfully, she and her family stayed safe from debris. We have a bunch of trees in our yard, kind of like a little forest. And um, the tornado, as it was going through, it knocked down all of the trees it came across and kind of put them in a spiral pattern, too. So when we went after, we've, we're still cleaning up the trees from oh, wow. when it happened. A tree ended up falling on our house and kind of damaging a little bit of our roof and one of our gutters. Whether you're looking for cost-effective materials that better withstand debris or you're in a worst-case scenario dealing with tornado damage, research at Texas A&M is being done to improve our livelihoods when dealing with the impacts of tornadic debris. At A&M, we have our Center for Infrastructure Renewal. The infrastructure is building construction, so we look at different types of construction materials, you know, you know whether it's wood or, or high-performance concrete and, and other common building materials, and, and they can be easily uh, tuned to withstand uh, wind loads and, uh, and, and conceivably uh, provide some penetration resistance to airborne objects. And then also, Texas A&M has a facility called Disaster City that whose sole mission is to you know, look at the effects of, of natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes, and, and establish uh, uh, best practices uh, for surviving them. Now, hopefully, you and your loved ones won't have to put these practices into place, but if you do, now you're prepared for when sunny turn severe. Up next, meteorologist Colleen Campbell's here to join us and she's going to tell us about a distinct noise you hear outside when a tornado warning is issued. If you're a true Texan, it's hard to mistake that sound. A warning siren. Have you ever wondered how these sirens work? Or even better, who activates them? Tyler has 32 of these warning sirens placed throughout the city, and they usually are tested monthly on the first Tuesday of every month around 11 a.m. on quiet weather days, so there's no confusion. This is only a test. But the sirens aren't only for storm warnings. Tyler police say that's a misconception. So there's a lot of different times that we will make the decision to set off the sirens. And one of those is a tornado warning issued for our area from the National Weather Service. 
it can be for hazmat situations. If we were to see, have a hazmat spill or something like that, we, the most common use for them, though, is going to be the tornado sirens and these severe weather alerts. And they're not designed to alert you if you're inside your home. They are to be heard when you're outside to let you know that you need to go inside and turn to your local news station. During a severe weather event, they can be a useful tool. At first, I don't know, I felt like maybe I was losing my hearing for a second because it was like a ringing in your ear when you like hear something loud for too long. Um, but then Ashley knew what it was and she said we need to go. So we went. Once I heard that sound, that automatically brought flashbacks of me, you know, you know, just taking cover whenever you hear those sirens, you know, especially loud like that in your ear. But what if the equipment malfunctions and the siren doesn't sound? A situation that occurred recently in Henderson County. When we set it off, it wouldn't go off. So within just a few minutes, four of them were up here trying to manually set it off. Mm -hmm. So to the best of our knowledge, and we're not experts, but the uh, the signal sending part of that operation fail. In a Facebook post, the city of Chandler's police chief, Kaylin Rollins, explained the city's storm warning system failed to operate and to replace the system would be a costly repair. Our city has outgrown the system that we have. We have two rotating sirens in, in town, one on the north, one on the south side of town. Um, a lot of people have asked me why we haven't updated. Mainly it's, it's an extreme cost. Um, to have a system that everybody would be happy with would probably spend well over two, three hundred thousand dollars. That is why meteorologists stress of having more than one way of receiving severe weather information. It's a breezy day at William B. Travis Elementary. As a nearby tornado siren sits quiet and still, these kids are in motion. But they're not on their way to class. They're filing into the gym for a tornado drill. Two rows at a time, two rows at a time. As the students file in, teachers keep count. The green card means everybody is here and every single student in the class is here. Mm -hmm. And the red card means that we're missing somebody. It's a routine these kids follow at least twice a year. The idea to make sure everyone knows what to do if there's a storm bearing down on campus. It is kind of scary, but I feel safe when I'm with adults mm -hmm. because um, they can get you to a safe place. With a push of a button, 
the school gymnasium transforms into a state-of-the-art shelter. The tornado shelter itself is complete concrete and it's built to withstand uh, wind velocity up to 250 miles per hour. Complete with a ventilation system and designed to accommodate a large number of people. The gymnasium itself is, uh, has a capacity of up to 800 people. And so that being said, even if we were having an event and parents were here on campus, whoever's here can actually uh, come into the shelter and they'll be locked down in place with the students as well. With first aid and other supplies on standby. Emergency drinking water that has a five year life span. Emergency poncho, safety scissors should we need them. Providing preparation, practice, and a reassuring message promoting calm in the storm. Tornado warning. When we come on TV and tell you that, what's your first thought? Do you know where to go in case of a tornado warning? How about you're at home? Well, we came here at Palestine to the Stiefer residents to find out where they shelter in case of a tornado. This is Dr. Alvi Stiefer Hi. and his Hi. wife, Judy. Hi. Good Hi. to see you. It's nice, nice to see you. Can you show us where you guys shelter inside your home? Sure can. Come on in. Thank you. Well, we actually just moved here about six years ago, and I wanted a sturdy house because of East Texas. In the event of the weather alarm goes off, what we do, we come down this hallway here, and then we go into this closet here. Now, in this closet, is it's surrounded by other rooms. And walls. Right, and so the, it's basically the center of the house. There is no outside wall associated with it. No windows. Absolutely. I said my wife is on oxygen all the time, so we got emergency cylinder there, and we also got things to bring down, heavy quilts and stuff to cover our heads with. But, but this is going to help you yeah, avoid head. debris, or if, if the wall would fall in the or the ceiling. We have a first aid kit and the lantern that, that goes with us. You pull it up. Also, we have ponchos. Good idea. That we have to put on to protect ourselves from the rain. We always tell people to also have maybe some emergency food and water in case you were trapped. And True. of course, the cell phone with you. Maybe another kind of radio to listen to weather warnings and whenever the all clear is given. We also have an emergency case that has all of our important papers in it. It has our birth certificates and all those things in it. In the event that we lose the house and everything in the house, we still have our important papers with us. So if you can't make it to this closet, you have an alternate space? Correct. Okay, that would be over here. And this is in a bedroom? This is in a bedroom, and it's also a reinforced closet. However, it's still not as secure as that one in the hallway. The Stevers have a good plan, but let me show you some places that wouldn't be say the best place to be for a tornado. A den like this or a living room, look at all of the windows. Those windows, if they break, that glass becomes a flying projectile. And look here, in the kitchen, we've got more windows. The windows, again, can break easily and it can put you in harm's way. These dishes are beautiful, but what if strong straight line winds or a tornado start to blow these around? Again, they become dangerous. The dining room, it's in the middle part of the house, right? But once again, we have windows. Plus, we have outside facing walls. So we really wanna make ourselves as safe as possible by putting ourselves in the middle most part of the house. And if the closets weren't here, here'd be another option. Closing off all the doorways in this hallway, that would make a perfect safe place. Hey, Brett, are you all right in there? Yeah, I'm great. All Thanks right. for having us over today. And I'm oh, really impressed you. that you guys practice your plan and you know where to go. I think that's just an awesome first step in staying safe in severe weather. Another way to stay safe is by downloading our CBS 19 app. When you're in your safe place, you can track the storms and then you'll know when it's safe to come out.